Our next presenter, who is Julia Fonseca, um, and she's presenting about mega drought in the Cienega Creek Natural Preserve. And so Julia, uh, again, Julia Fonseca is um, the Environmental Planning Manager for the Office of Sustainability and Conservation at Pima County. She works with uh, individuals, agencies, and groups towards conservation of species. And previous to that, she worked on restoring aquifers and floodplains for the Pima County Regional Flood Control District. Thank you very much for joining us today, Julia. And um, you are now welcome to, to present. Well, welcome everybody to the Cienega Creek Natural Preserve. Uh, this is an area of about 4,000 acres. It's located southeast of Tucson. It was set aside by the Board of Supervisors in 1986 to preserve one of the last free flowing streams in Southern Arizona. And I was lucky in 1986 to be the first preserve manager. This area is now managed by the Pima County Parks Department, um, but it's remained my kind of living laboratory to try to understand uh, how plants respond to changes in land use and also change the changing climate that we have. Maybe I can advance the picture. Yeah. Okay. So here's a location map for you. Uh, the area in green here is the Cienega Creek Natural Preserve. Uh, this is Cienega Creek. It originates in the Sonoida grasslands and comes underneath Interstate Highway 10 here. Uh, you might have crossed it if you've gone from Tucson to Benson. And um, it's fed by um, Agua Verde Creek, which brings in runoff from the Rincon Mountains and Davidson Canyon, which brings in runoff from the Santa Rita Mountains and the Empire Mountains. So you can see it's kind of a funnel, uh, a funnel that goes through an area of bedrock here before uh, going into the Tucson Basin. And if you live in Tucson, you might know it as Pantana Wash. The name changes as it enters uh, the Tucson Basin. And both the name Pantano and Cienega refer to the, the swampy, uh, grasslands that used to occur along the stream in this particular area. <clears throat> the Cienega um, Creek Natural Preserve is also um, uh, not only a, a funnel, but a gap. It's in, a, in this large space between the Rincon Mountains and the Santa Rita Mountains. And if we think about it in ecosystem terms, uh, it's at the ecotone between the Sonoran Desert and the Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, but the mountains bring in a flora from the Rocky Mountains and the uh, Mexican Sierra Madre. So it's a, it's a rich area to, to be looking at. Here's an outline of my talk, some of the things I'll cover. Um, I'll spend a little time on uh, the history of the area, talk about some of my um, study methods, the vegetation changes I've seen, and speculate on some future trends. So this is a, an historic map from 1846. And in this area, you see the, the Catalinas, the Rincon Mountains. And over here, you have uh, San Agustin de Tucson, Tucson. These were the only two communities, Tucson and San Javier del Bac, because of the Santa Cruz River. Leading from the Santa Cruz River are two roads that go to Cienega de los Pimas. So the area that we're talking about was occupied territory of the Tahana Autumn people, uh, or as they were known in that time as the Pima people. And here's a photograph from 1880. It's uh, standing on a hill slope above Cienega Creek, uh, looking across the broad grassy floodplain. In, the, in this area, you can see some Jazzalirion. Uh, over here, you can see some Sacatone grass. It's pretty much grass all the way across. Uh, the rancher who uh, worked in the area in 1880 described this uh, bottomland as being sacatone and salt grass with some mesquites uh, here on the margin of the valley that grew uh, in the, primarily in the tributaries. But there's been a tremendous amount of change since then, um, overgrazing certainly, this railroad construction certainly, uh, fire regime change and culminating in arroyo formation and drought in the late 1890s. So some pretty dramatic changes here. Um, these show the, on the right-hand side, you can see 
the destruction of the railroad through Sienega Creek by floods that started the very next year after the railroad was constructed in 1880. <clears throat> and on the uh, left-hand side, you can see, this is a little later, uh, 1915 or so, the arroyo has formed, trenching through those grassy bottomlands, and now mesquite is growing in what used to be the Sacaton Plain. Uh, so you might have heard ranchers talk about the mesquite invasion of, in southern Arizona that had to do with the lowering of the water table here along Cienega Creek, which allowed the, the mesquite to come in. This is a photo pair taken from the same location, 1880 versus 2011. Uh, you can see the hill slope has become more shrubby, uh, but the big change is really the um, mesquite that came into the Sacaton grasslands. And then over in here, uh, you can see the white shapes are the cottonwood trees. Uh, that came, that mark the position of the of the new arroyo. Well, it's hundred years over hundred years old now. So big, huge, uh, traumatic landscape change. These were the kinds of changes occurring in the in the uh, American Southwest pretty much simultaneously from a geologic standpoint, and they wrecked uh, an economy that was based on on agriculture. Um, so it was, um, and, you know, this is an area where agriculture had been practiced for thousands of years. So um, that's the historic context. Um, I, I um, after, <clears throat> well, I started out here in, in the preserve at a time when uh, the length of the flowing channel was about eight miles. Um, and then I went on to do other things, but I came back to do a flora in 2013. And uh, at that time, the length of the channel was about a, a mile. So, um, Huge changes uh, as well in the climate uh, between the 18 uh, between the 1980s and uh, and today, <clears throat> and realizing uh, that throughout the term of the the time that I was collecting plants between 2013 and 19 is part of this larger North American mega drought. You may have heard about that. Um, it's you know what's driving the Colorado River system you know down to nothing. So my questions are how plants responded to the changing climate and how might plants um, respond in the future? And, and what can I learn from this, this tool of doing a, um, a flora? So this is um, something called the Standardized Precipitation Evapotranspiration Index. And I chose this because it's a little bit more uh, connected to what plants need. It, it, it includes not only the um, precipitation record, but also the, the temperatures. <clears throat> so you can see here, 1950s drought, um, Julio Betancourt, you may have heard him talk about the, the damage that was done in the Southwest during the, the 1950s. Um, here's the, the pulse of, um, you know, a lot of rain here in the, the uh, 1980s, uh, again, when I came in. And then the, the mega drought here, which in, in the preserve probably started a little earlier than 2000. Uh, so there's no long-term um, plot data in the preserve. Um, but uh, so I was going to use the inventory of the flora that I did and compare those to uh, plant collections that have been made in earlier times. Um, also to a plant list that I had had and maintained up to about 2001. Um, so, you know, are we losing species? Are we gaining cold limited species between this? relatively short time period between, you know, 2001 and today. Uh, I also remapped uh, vegetation communities. There have been a, a, a vegetation community map done in, in 1991. So this shows um, at the bottom is the vegetation map from 1991. And the two things that I used to, um, as a basis uh, for altering the, the vegetation map, one was, um, <clears throat> an analysis uh, that our IT department did using a four color um, national agricultural inventory uh, imagery uh, that helped me distinguish the areas that were more grassy versus the areas that were more mesquite <laughs> and the areas that had the really um, big trees that are uh, transpiring a lot uh, versus mineral substrates, that kind of thing. Big kind of gross changes, uh, not something that you could directly you know, proceed with a vegetation map from. Uh, but in combination with um, all sorts of plant observations that I made over time uh, at different locations as I collected the plants. 
And um, the results of this work, uh, you can read in the, the publication called Kenosha. Um, there's also a, a checklist available uh, to the public um, under SciNet, which is a, a wonderful resource, a database of um, material that is in um, uh, herbaria in the Southwest, but also um, just collections that people have made or observations that people have made. So here's a, a summary graph. Uh, this summary graph um, compares what I found uh, to other important riparian areas in southern Arizona. And it's sorted by area with the largest one at the top. <clears throat> so I found uh, four, uh, 508 uh, taxa within the Cienega Creek Natural Preserve during the, the time period 2013 to 19, um, roughly. Most of it was in that time period. And uh, you can see it, it um, compares favorably to, to, to Macaquery and Sonoya Creek. Sonoya Creek has a few more uh, plants, <clears throat> and perhaps that's because, you know, Steve McLaughlin, he's a superb botanist, um, and he was working in an area that um, is more affiliated with some of the Mexican species that we don't have uh, in the Cienega Creek Natural Preserve. So there, this one is about the same area. Um, but you can see, you know, uh, La Cienegas National Conservation Area is huge in comparison, uh, and not so many plants. That may be because it's a bit in, incomplete as a flora. So what are some of the species that um, I was not able to relocate? Um, well, there are about 55 species in all, and uh, so that's about 10% of the flora. There may be a signal there um, in, in this. Uh, these plants that I did not find are mostly herbs, but there are two willows, um, Salix taxifolia, the U-leafed willow. And then there was one bond plant uh, willow that was in the preserve for many years, and it was last seen in 2004. I presume it was um, died and was swept away by a flood. The Salix definitely was a drought um, loss. About 10 species of the 55 are wetland species um, as well. Um, and then there are two rare cacti, which I think may also be related to um, not having, uh, to, to the drought. Um, it could be also that I overlooked them. These are hard to find cacti. Um, I did find um, one of the Mammillaria hateri, out, which is on the right-hand side, um, outside the preserve boundary, um, just outside. Um, but, uh, yeah, I went back to the place where uh, Mark Baker found Kimo pineapple cactus, wasn't able to see it. So um, six disturbance-oriented uh, species um, are also missing, and this may have more to do with the removal of livestock than, than the drought. But there are alternate explanations, you know, for not being able to find a species that maybe other people had seen, so um, we can't be sure. Uh, on the left-hand side is some information from uh, a work that was done in the Cienega Creek Natural Preserve by Katz and others uh, during the mega drought. They looked at um, quadrex located in the floodplain um, in different, you know, either ephemeral, intermittent, or perennial reaches. And you can see that the Cienega Creek diversity of plant species in the floodplain compares very favorably to the Hacienda and the San Pedro River. So even if we've lost species, um, it still looks pretty, or did look pretty species rich in comparison to other um, rivers. And then in terms of wetland species per site, uh, again, Cienega Creek was right up there. On the right-hand side is something called a species accumulation curve. Um, it shows on the horizontal axis um, how many field air hours I spent or other people who were helping me spent in a preserve. And then on the vertical axis is the unique species uh, that we were able to find over time uh, as a cumulative figure. So it's generally a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, and what one hopes is that it, with, with greater field effort, it sort of flattens out to an asymptote, you know, to show that, yeah, the preserve has this many species, even if we didn't find them all. But that didn't happen because, it, as you can see, it's still climbing. And I think that might be related to the fact that it is so well connected um, in terms of the funnel, receiving plants uh, all the time from upper watersheds. Um, I know if I go out there, I can find a new species pretty much any time I go out there. But I also know that 
you know, some of the plants that I do see, they seem to wink out uh, along the stream. Even within the, the course of the time period that I was looking at it, I would, you know, find it and then not, not see it in its field season. So it just may be a very um, diverse uh, and, and what do we call it, high, high turnover area. Um, <clears throat> so turning now to the vegetation community change uh, as revealed in the, the vegetation remapping, uh, this is what I see. I see, um, and it's sort of the nutshell of what will follow. Um, the cottonwood forest uh, has been declining as a result of the mega drought. Um, the mesquite forest um, on the highest terraces is declining, even as mesquite matures on the floodplain. Uh, the burrow brush community has made a big, big expansion, and um, I think we're seeing more floodplain grass and savanna. So this is what the um, cottonwood dieback looks like. It started um, in the um, probably mm, 2004 or five, um, but uh, really got uh, going in the 2011, 12, 13, that, that time period. Um, and that was even before the what we call the non-soon of 2020. Um, and this, this is an area further downstream from those photographs. Uh, this was in 2018. And the next one is 2022. So you can see a lot of dead cottonwoods along here, even though the stream flow has now been restored by a, a large flood that occurred in 2021, brought up the water table again, uh, but too late for these cottonwood trees. Here's a photo pair along Cienega Creek in a, an area that has a high water table. Um, but you can see even in 2002, there were some cottonwoods that looked very stressed here uh, in, the, in the, this area. Uh, then by 2021, um, you can see some cottonwoods that didn't look so vigorous, but they're located here now. These look pretty good. And there's this big area of ash trees that has come in uh, during the past 20 years to this area. So if we look at this um, graph by Juliet Stromberg, um, this relates her research about the preferred rooting depth of different uh, riparian plants to the water table. Um, so what I observed in the time period that I was doing this for was that there was no recruitment of bidding willow, no recruitment of cottonwood, and no recruitment of um, seep willow. Uh, this indicates that the groundwater conditions are not favorable for recruiting these, these plants. <clears throat> Instead, what I saw was, you know, more ash trees coming in, um, more hackberry coming in. And of course, mesquite is, is thriving when it has access to the water table. As I said earlier, there was a flood uh, after, pretty much after I finished the flora in 2021 that um, did a lot of groundwater recharge. And now I see seep willow coming up along the stream in many, many places. Um, I haven't yet seen gooding willow. It could be that I've overlooked it, um, but uh, definitely a lot of a lot of seep willow got started. <clears throat> On the um, right-hand side here, uh, this is a hydrograph US Geological Survey provided. Um, before the July 2021 flood, uh, the base flows were extremely low at their gauge site. Um, but the, this flood was the largest one, 15,000 cubic feet per second, uh, since 1958. Uh, and it was, of course, a wonderful winter, I mean, a wonderful monsoon season. So there were many floods that, um, that summer. And it brought up the, the base flows um, for the river. Um, now much, much higher than they had been for, for many years. Uh, and then this summer, even though we didn't have really big floods, uh, that base flow has remained high. Um, so that's a good sign for uh, renewed recruitment in the future. Uh, turning now to the mesquite forest, um, if you drive to Benson, you will cross Sienega Creek, you can look out and you will see a lot of dead uh, mesquite trees on the high terrace, the 1880 
floodplain, really. Um, these trees are now dying. And uh, same thing over in here, this area, uh, a lot of mesquite death. The mesquites that are surviving are the ones that are down, have a, a position lower um, in the landscape, closer to the water table. And then these cottonwoods um, shown here in this May 2020 photo, they didn't survive. Uh, this is the area that was also where the Salix taxifolia was located. Um, so that's died back then. At the same time, there are mesquites in other places that are doing just fine. Um, so this is Davidson Canyon, one of the important tributaries of Cienega Creek. Uh, this area was a, a field uh, that was cleared by the rancher in the 70s to provide greater pasture. And um, during the wet period of the 1980s, it was um, recolonized by mesquite. Um, and you can see that they've continued to grow just fine. Um, they have probably have their roots uh, in the water table at this location. So here's the plant community that really expanded a lot. This is the burrow brush community. Um, it looks a lot like desert broom. It's ambrosia monogyra, it's a pioneer species, and it's really come into areas of open channel. Um, we haven't, during the mega drought, we didn't have a lot of large floods, so there was a lot of opportunity for vegetation to <clears throat> uh, colonize the, the river bottom, and, and it did, growing from 18 acres to 147. Um, the floodplain grasslands look like this, um, large mesquites that are basically um, surrounded by a very uh, grass-rich and um, herb-rich um, cover. Uh, a lot of the grasses are um, either layman's left grass or Ceteria um, leuca, leuca pila. Um, a lot of either one of those types of grasses, um, but there can also be quite a bit of Johnson grass and, and blue panic. So um, I mapped a new um, grassland unit in certain places that was just pure Johnson grass or, or blue panic grass. Blue panic was a, a, a grass that was introduced to one area within the preserve uh, that I know of anyway, that um, really, really expanded a lot in the, the the years that I've been there um, from that one area. Some of the species uh, that might be affiliated with climate change um, that I noted that I hadn't seen before were um, triangle leaf sage, canyon ragweed, and Mexican palo verde. And I also see an increased distribution of brittle bush, buffalo grass, and tree tobaccos. So these may be related to the warming trend in the area. Uh, the map over here shows the distribution of, you know, verse age. And this, so, you know, again, the edge of the Sonoran Desert here. This map is from um, Ray Turner at U.S. Geological Survey. He's the author of The Changing Mile, which was one of the books that got me interested in this question of how vegetation community changes. In yellow and orange are the Sonoran Desert units. Um, this is the creosote bush portion, and this is the um, Saguaro Palo Verde community up here. <clears throat> and he showed that the edge of the Soren Desert hadn't yet reached the, the preserve in 1974. So this is Colossal Cave Road here. Uh, the preserve starts right here. And he, he showed the little outlier polygons here, you know, of Sonoran Desert kind of creeping closer. But I, I would place the edge of the Sonoran Desert, you know, more like this right now, out maybe here. Here's a photograph um, looking across the preserve to the north bank, and you can see all of the foothills Palo Verde in bloom. Um, really, you know, a lot of foothills Palo Verde uh, in that area. So uh, that's part of my rationale for calling that Sonoran Desert, but also these some of these other species that I see occurring. So in conclusion, um, I would say the mega drought did shrink the area of wet wetlands along the creek and the cottonwood forest. Um, it shifted uh, the, the crop of new riparian trees towards uh, ash and other water thrifty species. <clears throat> it's uh, killing the um, mesquite forests that came in at the turn of the previous century on those high terraces. Uh, but despite all that, the Sienega Creek Preserve remains floristically diverse uh, in comparison to other major uh, rivers in southern Arizona. Um, I think at this piece, this scale, um, you know, a, a species diversity doesn't really um, give us a clear signal uh, of what's going on with the drought. Um, 
but the the mapping the remapping you know method was was more important i think in understanding how the community is changing uh, and just to give some perspective on on this um, is a work by uh, Villa Real and others. Uh, they looked, they used uh, Landsat imagery to look at the entire uh, Santa Cruz watershed, what's happening with the uh, riparian forests, and um, they they call these zero riparian deciduous forests. These are largely mesquite dominated, but they may have a, a few cottonwoods in them. So again, in the uh, 80s, you know, they showed an increase in the deciduous forest. That's exactly what I saw at Santa Cruz Creek Natural Preserve. Um, they saw decline starting in 1989, um, so in the 90s. Uh, but that was the time period when this young cottonwood forest was, um, was expanding in the preserve because we had the high water tables. Um, and then the, um, the next two decades brought even more losses, uh, or over the next decade rather, brought even more losses. So um, what's happening in the in the Santa Cruz Creek Natural Preserve is also happening elsewhere in, in the Santa Cruz watershed. Uh, in terms of future prospects for the watershed, um, in terms of climate change from the University of Arizona's recently downscaled uh, climate models, we can expect um, less rain, uh, both winter and summer uh, overall. Um, and a hotter overall temperatures. That's not a surprise. Um, but um, they're also saying that there's more potential for more extreme rainfall events. And uh, this is what we saw uh, in uh, 2021. Um, so it, um, and here's a picture down here of, of, of uh, Davidson Canyon, a, a segment that hadn't flowed for many years is now flowing very well and continuing to flow even as we speak. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, these, these poles of very wet and very dry are, are both aspects of climate change. Um, it brings the prospect that we might see these more of these rescue recharge events, even as we see extreme drought continue on, on the uplands uh, because of this funnel position of Seattle Creek in the watershed. So for the preserve, I would um, just guess that um, species richness might remain high, even as the abundance of, of species continues to decline. Um, so we should expect fewer gooding willows and cottonwoods in our future, I think, and more variable floodplain conditions. We might see eastward expansion of more Sonoran Desert and more tropical species coming up. Um, and in terms of the grass cover, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, definitely, I think we're losing some of the perennial grasses in terms of abundance. Um, and but those seem to be re being replaced by a lot of annual species um, on the landscape, and and some new non-natives as well. Um, and then I think we can expect more fire as well. Um, we have more people living close to the preserve and using the area, uh, so that usually brings more fire. Uh, so what can managers do? Well, we're managing livestock and recreation impacts. Um, that is something that the Pima you know, County Flood Control District and the Parks Department has worked very hard on. Uh, and working also with uh, groups like Watershed Management Group on uh, forestalling some of the erosion. Uh, we're targeting some of the Arundo Donax. There's not very many species, uh, plants, uh, clumps of those. So it, it seems like we might be able to get rid of that entirely. It came from a uh, landscape planting outside the preserve. Um, we want to coordinate more with fire districts. We have a new fire management plan uh, to share with them uh, and fire strategies that we want to implement. And we'd love to be able to acquire more land around the preserve. However, um, right now there's not a lot of funding to that. Uh, we have um, established upland vegetation monitoring plots now that will give us a much better picture about what's going on. Um, so those will be uh, read again in coming years, and, and we'll, we'll really know a lot more than the study would be able to tell us. So in conclusion, I want to thank everybody who contributed to this project. It really did take a village, and uh, I will be ready for your questions. Sure. Thank you very much, Julia. And we do have a few questions that have come in already. I'll just remind the audience, if you have questions, we have about 10 minutes. Um, for questions with Julia, um, please enter those in the Q&A box if you can find that. 
Um, yeah, yeah. I'd like and, to uh, speak to that question. That's a great okay, one. yeah. So um, I'll, I'll go to our first question in the Q&A box. Um, can you talk a little about the Arroyo Formation? Um, what drove the formation? Yeah, so that's something that's been debated in the Southwest for many years. Um, if you listen to the people who were there at the time, <clears throat> they certainly thought that it was driven by livestock overgrazing. Um, and these would be people like uh, Kirk Bryan and, and Aldo Leopold and, and others. Abuse of the land in many and numerous ways, uh, but generally uh, the concentration of livestock. Uh, along Cienega Creek, <clears throat> we know that um, this was the shipping area for the Empire Ranch. Uh, so it was also you know, an important area to be grazed. And, and they had tremendous numbers of livestock, and before that sheep, um, grazing along the, the floodplain here. And because at that time there was no, um, there were no waters, you know, the livestock waters, windmills and that sort of thing. So the um, livestock would concentrate in areas that had a lot of, um, a lot of meadows, a lot of spring fed meadows like this. Uh, but the other thing that was going on here was the construction of the railroad. So we also know that they cut a lot of mesquite uh, for um, fences and the like. Um, let's see, one of the photos that I showed showed the uh, retake fence that was comprised of mesquite. So a lot of mesquite cutting on the hill slopes where the mesquite occurred, the hill slopes and tributaries, not on the, not on the floodplain back then. And then this berm, I mean, this is a berm and in, in certain areas um, of the creek, especially near where they would cross the low spots, it concentrated the flows. So we know that in um, the railroad was constructed in 1880 and the incision began the following year and it was accelerated in this area uh, by another flood in 1887. So it's pretty clear that uh, there were what some people call trigger events that um, got this started here. In other cases, in Altar Valley, for instance, it was wagon roads um, and overgrazing. So, um, but the, then the complication is that geologically speaking, we can look at the sediments exposed in Cienega Creek <clears throat> and other places along the Santa Cruz River. And we can see that um, there are prehistoric arroyo cutting events. So while the dominant mode of these river floodplains should be aggradation, there are in the geologic record um, periods of incision uh, that are short-lived but very dramatic. And uh, there have been, I think, two or three Arroyo incision events uh, prehistorically along Cienega Creek. Okay, and we, we have had several more questions come in, so we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Uh, two of them are a bit related. Um, so first, how does tamarisk factor into competition for limited water, especially during drought years, some areas of the preserve have large stands of tamarisk, is it being reduced? Yeah, so tamarisk uh, in the preserve, well, let, let me first cite some research, I guess, by um, Juliet Stromberg. Um, it's her um, finding that um, mesquite is, I mean, uh, tamarisk is really more a symptom uh, than a cause. So she, her work, I think, um, showed that cottonwoods can outcompete um, mesquite, uh, I keep saying mesquite, the tamarisk. They, cottonwoods grow quickly and they shade the, um, the ground a lot. Um, so the issue is more about, you know, like dams increasing um, uh, the potential for tamarisk to come in and then also salinity. Um, so if you're removing tamarisk, but you're not addressing some of the causes, uh, which would be dams and salinity and potentially the disturbance of, of livestock, um, then you're, you're really, you know, not, not going to solve the problem. But it's still, you know, you'll still see the, you haven't addressed the, the things that are leading to tamarisk being dominant. Um, so there are areas of naturally high salinity along Cienega Creek. 
um, the, the water is, is quite saline, uh, in part because some of the groundwater passes through the Pantano Formation, which is um, highly gypsiferous. So there's a natural, and if you look at the distribution of the, the tamarisk, uh, sometimes you can see a direct association with those uh, large masses of tamarisk with the Pantano Formation, which has the gypsum in it, uh, in the preserve. So it's a little bit different there maybe than some other areas, uh, but I would say that that, that was one factor. Um, I know when the livestock were in the preserve, every summer I would see you know masses and masses of young tamarisk um, come in and um, some of those established um, as well. So that was a pretty active process in the 80s. And once we got the livestock out, I don't know if it was, you know, again, it could be largely because the, of the, the drought, um, but I didn't see those seedling tamarisk as, as much. Um, during the three, the, during the time period that I did the, the field work between 2013 and 2019, um, I only saw one pulse of um, tamarisk seedlings come up in the channel, and it did not look like those thrived. Um, so I, I uh, and then in terms of uh, treatments, yes, we have done treatments uh, with garlon of uh, tamarisk stands. Um, mixed results, um, you know, it, it was effective if you do it correctly, uh, but it is very difficult to, to um, you know, get the entire stand. Um, and then, you know, again, if you're not addressing some of the causes, and we can't really address some of the, the factors that, that favor tamarisk being there, like the salinity. Okay. And then there's a semi-related question also dealing with invasives. Um, as you remove invasives like a rondo, um, what is the strategy to stabilize? So you may have mentioned some of this already, but um, maybe just more um, focused, uh, an answer focused on the strategies to stabilize after the invasives are um, removed. Yeah, so the the, um, the natural process is really very good in terms of bringing in um, new species well suited for, you know, the sites that are disturbed. So, I mean, removing a rundo is a disturbance. Um, and it can, you know, um, what takes its place has a lot to do with the, the local conditions in terms of the water table. Um, and in terms of, you know, what the floods bring uh, with the next pulse. Um, so we do not um, seed the area uh, after we remove the, the arundo. Um, these are very localized disturbances. There's a, just a few clumps, so we're not going to be doing any kind of, you know, seeding of the area. It's really just to get those rhizomes out. Um, And then um, we, we have just a couple of minutes left. So maybe there can be some quick answers. Um, how would the proposed mine in the Santa Rita affect the preserve? Yeah, so let's um, go back to the map here. Right, so the, the proposed Rosemont mine is uh, located in this area right here in the bedrock uh, or the, the brown part here. And it, um, you know, the, the big concern is that this is our link uh, to high elevation uh, recharge. Uh, this part of the Santa Rita Mountains has a lot of limestone. Um, it is a recharge area. It gets more precipitation. And so it recharges the water table. The water table brings groundwater down along Davidson Canyon. And uh, we know from isotope studies that this has, um, this underflow continues even when you don't see the surface flow like on, on Davidson Canyon. So it's a nice contribution of water uh, to Cienega Creek. So we are concerned about the impacts of that, the dewatering of the, the area that must be done if they're gonna dig, dig down 2000 feet into the um, bedrock here. <laughs> There's a lot of dewatering that would occur uh, initially um, particularly. And then because it creates this basically hole in the aquifer, you know, it changes the, the, the recharge. The recharge all kind of stays in this area rather than, than going outward. But moreover, the sediment change was a big, big issue. 
as well. Um, if it disrupts the sediment train, uh, then that could cause some incision along the main stem of Cienega Creek, because Davidson is a big sediment contributor that actually kind of stabilizes the base levels along the creek uh, in this, this confluence area. By the way, this is where the Arizona Trail crosses um, Cienega Creek as it heads south. Um, so that's an area that people visit quite a bit. Um, so yeah, mainly it's uh, sediment and water, uh, surface water runoff as well. I mean, all of the surface water would be diverted from this part of the watershed. Um, there are, you know, other areas obviously that would continue contributing, but that's another issue. And then finally, the hazardous material spills uh, in the initial mine proposal, uh, this was to be the route that all of the um, uh, reagents used in mining would, would be brought in and then the copper concentrate would also leave. And so you can see the, the road is right along Davidson Canyon and the potential for spills was would be there um, and contamination. So at, not to mention tailings, dams, failures and the like. So that was the other you know concern. Now uh, the proposal that the company has would have the access coming in from uh, Santa Rita Road. So that means that the hazardous materials would be brought in in a different way. Um, and that would be, a, would relocate it through, uh, you know, Salarita rather than the, the, the Davidson Canyon area. Um, but the dewatering would still occur, you know, in that mine proposal. Um, okay. So the, yeah, a lot of the same impacts still.